Professor Walter uh, received his diploma in chemistry from the Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany in uh, 1991, and uh, his doctor of engineering, uh, I think, from the Max Planck Institute uh, in Germany. Uh, he worked as postdoctoral fellow in Max Planck Institute uh, and at the University of Vermont in Burlington and joined the Department of Chemistry at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in 1999. In 2016, uh, Professor Walter founded and now co-directs the Center for RNA Biomedicine as a grassroots effort to synergize RNA-related research across the University of Michigan, where he also serves as the Recom Diversity Ally in broadening the participation of diverse students in our chemistry graduate program, uh, serves as associate director of the University of Michigan uh, post-baccalaureate research education program, and is the faculty director of the microscopy core in the biomedical research core facilities. Um, Professor Walter published over 190 publications, uh, some of which are in uh, cell, molecular cell, science, nature, nature structural and molecular biology, nature nanotechnology, and many other um, outstanding journals. The overarching goal of Dr. Walter's group is to understand structure dynamics, function relationships in non-coding ribonucleic acid and cRNA using innovative single molecule and bulk solution biochemical and biophysical tools. And then to adapt these and cRNAs for biomedical, bioanalytical and nanotechnological applications. Without further ado, I give a uh, stage to Dr. Walton. Thank you, Yulia and Sonia, for the kind introduction and for inviting me here for this seminar. Now we can all get together across the nation, across the world even, for seminars like this, given our familiarity now with Zoom webinars. So it's great to be here. And um, given the context of this meeting as an ACS-related meeting, I want to really emphasize today how molecules or the realm of chemists actually play a very big role in biology. And in my particular case, uh, as you've heard, we work on RNA, we use single molecule fluorescence microscopy tools, and we bring thereby the single molecules into focus to look at that RNA world in which we live and have lived for a very long time. So that also uh, reminds me, of course, of uh, the serendipity of science that you see represented here with uh, what is also a folding free energy landscape. There are many, many attractive references, uh, interesting study objects that one can turn to during a scientific career. And for us, that has led to spreading out our wings in various different directions. Uh, what I'll talk about today is uh, a phenomenon called RNA silencing, uh, also um, referred to as microRNA mediated regulation. And we'll talk a little bit about RNA, uh, microRNA related uh, gene regulatory mechanisms that happen in our cells as we speak. We'll also uh, talk about um, how to detect these microRNAs. And here again, tools from chemistry in particular can play a big role and we developed a technology that we call SimRAPS that actually allows counting single molecules that could be biomarkers of disease. And of course, we have had many other passions over the years. Uh, ribozymes, remember first one, riboswitches is an RNA structural element that can are, undergo conformational changes in response to outside cues, uh, environmental cues and integrate them into gene regulatory mechanisms. We also studied splicing mechanism, and we did some DNA nanotechnology as referred from Julia briefly. Now, in order to give an overview, I want to just tell you first um, about this ever expanding complexity of the non-coding RNA world and associated nanomachines in the cell. And this really has been a theme from the origin of life several billion years ago till today. I then will give you two examples. First, we can peek inside the cell using our 
uh, single molecule fluorescence microscopy tools to track single microRNA molecules inside the cell at the nanoscale, figuring out what they do functionally, biologically there. And finally, we have this tool, SimReps, that I mentioned, where we are finding the proverbial needle in the haystack by a kinetic fingerprinting trick for the rapid ultra-specific detection of disease biomarkers at the single molecule level. Now, again, my theme today for this particular seminar is that the central dogma of molecular biology, everything in biology is really complex chemistry under the hood. And if you think about the dog, central dogma of molecular biology, the DNA makes RNA makes protein, I'm sure you've heard about this, then you have to keep in mind that the DNA molecule is really a polymer of individual building blocks that make hydrogen bonds, just like we know from any other chemical compound. And that ultimately leads to information carrying features that allow for replication. The DNA can be transcribed into RNA, represented here as just a single strand with similar building blocks. And those RNAs, typically referred to as messenger RNAs here, can be translated into protein. But that's really not the whole story. So what I'll talk about today is a little bit more about RNA, introduce that so-called non-coding RNAs, and tell a little bit more about where chemistry can help us understand them. So this all starts really expanding with the Human Genome Project, with, which, which was completed a little bit over 20 years ago now, um, and cost something like $3 billion. That's a billion with a B. And of course, since then, sequencing of a single genome or the RNA, so-called transcriptome, has come down by many orders of magnitude, costs now $300. Some companies in China claim $100 per genome. So really has decreased in cost much faster than CPUs, computer chips, have decreased in cost uh, following Moore's law. So this tells us that there are lots of opportunities to actually discover what's going on in the genome or the transcriptome. And one of the outcomes of the Human Genome Project was to figure out that when you look at the percent of DNA that is not actually coding for proteins, and it's not translated from mRNA to protein, as we saw in the previous slide, there's a clear dependence of complexity. So bacteria or prokaryotes have just 10 to 20% of their genome not coding for proteins and not being messenger RNAs. Oh, well, and as humans, it's 98, 97% or so that's not coding for proteins. And many of these RNAs are so-called non-protein coding or non-coding RNAs that still play a functional role as RNAs and never are translated. It's thought that at least 75% of the human genome, much more than gives rise to mRNAs and proteins, 75% is actually there to become functional RNA in a cell that goes about the business of the cell, regulating everything that's going on in there. And this has led to RNA in many ways over the last few years going viral because more discoveries are being made in, in part because of the um, investigations done by sequencing. You find new RNA molecules, you find where they are in the cell, in a tissue, in a body, and those discoveries then give rise to more people getting interested in using RNAs, coming into the field of RNA biology and RNA chemistry. And then those more people lead to more discoveries and so forth. So it's really an exponential growth that has uh, happened over the last few years, as I wrote in this little article here. Now, again, <clears throat> coming back to the central dogma of uh, molecular biology, the regular representation that you might find on the internet, as I took here or in textbooks, is of RNA being basically of the same structure as the DNA molecule, just a single strand that has some helical properties, but not much structure. That is really not correct. And RNA, as we now understand, is actually much more complex in structure, as complex, at least as proteins, following slightly different rules and proteins and folding. Generally speaking, they're very strong secondary structures where you have these hydrogen bonds in these helices that are complementary to one another, indicated here by these little thin lines. And in the form of a tRNA here, transfer RNA, that's important for translation, form four different helices here, color-coded, and in two dimensions would be represented like this, but in reality look more like this. It's an L shape that this tRNA molecule forms. It has two working ends, the so-called anticodon down here, which is where the messenger RNA is being read out and ultimately translated into an amino acid. Each codon 
um, recognized by an anticodon, its own anticodon, and it's the amino acid that's located here on the three prime and is chemically coupled here as an ester that then the ribosome takes to again translate a codon into an amino acid within a polypeptide chain and a protein that it makes. And you can see that this is a functional structure that's quite complex and folds up on itself. The brown and the green arms here come close together and fold up, like you see here. And that is ultimately what gives the function to this RNA molecule, the complex structure. And I would be remiss not also mentioning the beauty, the structural beauty of the ribosome itself. It, it has two subunits in gray here, the large, and in blue here, cyan, the small one. And you see that the gray and the cyan is actually the RNA components, and you see that how complex the folding is. It has, follows the same principles as we've seen for tRNA, but folds into a very uh, compact and robust structure. And there are proteins here in this um, uh, violet and blue colors, but you can see that they are relatively minor in terms of molecular mass and total contribution to the structure. And they're actually also not what catalyzes the peptide transfer, the peptide bond formation that builds a protein. That is actually the RNA itself, leading, giving rise to the idea that ribosomes might have been among the first RNA-based enzymes that gave rise to proteins, give, giving rise to life as we know it. And that's still the case today. The RNA is the catalyst in this ribosome. But this structure here shows you just how complex such an RNA, or in this case, RNA protein complex can be. Now, chemistry is really everywhere. Uh, in the complexity of the cell, this is a eukaryote, this is a human cell, if you wish, with the nucleus here and a cytoplasm in brown. And what you see is that in the nucleus, we have the DNA, of course, the genome that's being read out into an RNA. The RNA is then processed in different ways and exported through nuclear pore complexes, little holes in the membrane here into the cytoplasm. And there, they go about their business. If they are messenger RNA, they lead to translation by this ribosome that you saw on the previous slide. But then there are also many non-coding RNAs, like the microRNAs that I mentioned, that are responsible for regulating this translation process. For example, a microRNA binds a bunch of proteins into this what is called RISC, or RNA-induced silencing complex, that then gives rise to inhibition of translation, thereby regulating how much of the protein is actually made from this particular messenger RNA. And the idea is basically that nature uses many different non-coding RNAs for a combinatorial system to very, in very nuanced, but also very fast ways, change the expression programs and thereby the phenotype of a particular cell. That gives rise really to the rapid development that our a single cell and X cell, for example, undergoes once uh, as uh, it has fused with a sperm into uh, an embryo and growing from there. That's all possible because while the DNA is stored safely in the genome, in the nucleus, uh, the RNA comes out and does all these things, regulates things, um, and dictates exactly what the fate of the cell is. Now, we as a lab in chemistry want to understand this from first principle, from the chemistry perspective. And here, in the example of the microRNA, the protein and the RNA, microRNA come together to then find a complementary region in the messenger RNA, in the so-called un three prime untranslated region to bind to it and then regulate its gene expression. And ultimately, that has to do with individual base pairs between nuclear bases of the RNA molecules forming and individual hydrogens forming. So that is fundamentally a physical, physical chemistry process, an organic chemistry process, if you wish, you can use physical organic chemistry pr principles, for example, to understand how ultimately individual base pairs forming, hydrogen bonds forming, dictate the fate of an RNA inside the cell and thereby make the cell what it is. Now, RNA has been around for a long time. We believe that it was maybe the first molecule that really became self-replicating and lifelike. And that is represented here in a little depiction from, that I took from uh, the biochemistry textbook, quote and quote. Here you see kind of a primordial world with lots of uh, different molecules in the atmosphere, sunlight and heat and electrical discharges uh, in a form of lightning would have created um, local energy sources that ultimately fuse these molecules together. And it goes back to an experiment done in Chicago, not too, too long ago, not too far from here, by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey in 1953, that basically mixed uh, all these different gas molecules that are found in this atmosphere from nitrogen to carbon dioxide to hydrogen cyanide, 
water, ammonia, and methane together into a flask. And I should say that nowadays, of course, hydrogen cyanide is highly toxic, but at the time it gave rise to life because if you mix these molecules all together, then you can make very complex products if you just um, have enough water around, aqueous environment, water, uh, life needs water, and you heat that, you have electrical discharges here, and ultimately in this primitive atmosphere, uh, produce molecules by condensation of the smaller molecules and transition from inorganic to organic matter and ultimately to life. Now, this is of course a conjecture in a way, it's just showing, this experiment is just showing that it's possible to make a bunch of different molecules that are basic building blocks of life as we know it, for example, amino acids, right? So in these experiments, uh, Yuri um, here, um, Miller and Yuri actually found um, all sorts of amino acids from alanine, simple ones, to more complex one, tyrosine, glutamic acid, aspartic acid, that now are part of the 20 amino acids that are canonical amino acids used in the cell to make a protein. Using slightly different composition of the gas molecules, in particular ammonia and hydrogen cyanide in high concentration, you can actually make the nucleobases that make DNA and RNA, so the ATGC alphabet. You can also condense together carbon monoxide and hydrogen into what is called formite, and formite essentially is the most primitive, primitive hydrogen, um, uh, hydro, um, basically sugar molecule, if you wish, of the sum formula of CH2O, carbohydrate. And then you take a bunch of them and fuse them together. And eventually that then gives rise to um, all the molecules that you can uh, imagine that in the realm of sugars that of course are part of the backbone of RNA and DNAs. Oh, it has a riboposphate backbone, if you know. And lastly, you can also make lipids by a simple condensation reaction that includes, again, CO2, but then ethylene glycol, or sorry, ethylene molecules that um, can form a fatty acid if they condense together, uh, polymerizing based on these double bonds that open up. And ultimately, all of the components of a typical lipid that we would find in a membrane that, um, again, separates, for example, the nucleus and the cytoplasm and the cellular mem makes up the cellular membrane as well, uh, can be made in this uh, fashion from very, very simple inorganic molecules. Okay. So that gave rise in the 19th century by Ernst Haeckel to this idea of a primordial soup. The idea that you might have had a vast ocean as today, but now filled with all these organic molecules that if condensed could form a cell. Now, there are some challenges with this model, and I think one of the ideas is that perhaps uh, the high dilution you would get in the ocean is not ideal, so maybe you want to concentrate it in a tight pool, maybe you want to concentrate it on a surface of a mineral and have molecules condensed there, align so that they can polymerize more easily. Uh, there are also ideas that maybe in deep sea vents there's enough energy and other uh, energetic molecules around uh, and local concentrations high that um, would allow ultimately these um, uh, molecules to actually form molecules of life. Now, critical then becomes how do we get from simple organic molecules, maybe you can polymerize them, maybe even you can make a nucleic acid out of them if you polymerize them on the surface of a mineral catalyst. Um, how do you make more complex molecules out, out of those? And this, problem was essentially solved by, uh, at least intellectually, by showing that you can make catalysts that are of random sequence of the building blocks that you see here. And if these are RNA molecules, and there's a good chance that they might have been early on, then um, there is a probability, and it has been shown that this such a catalyst can be created in a test tube by in vitro evolution, that is able to align all the building blocks that are complementary to its own sequence, and then have them linked up to form a polymerized complement that then by some way, say heat and a deep sea vent get separated from one another by melting the two strands that then fold up on their own. If, if one of them becomes a catalyst that now can actually take the complement here and make itself basically by uh, again aligning the building blocks for the complement to the complement, 
and polymerizing them, now you have the ability of this catalyst here making more of itself effectively using the complementary template here um, as a way to copy itself. And you can then go back and make more of the complement, the template strand and back and forth and ultimately grow a lot of RNA strands. Now, if these grow and they each have slightly different sequences from that comes evolution. And evolution, of course, is in the Darwinian sense, the survival of the fittest, right? The molecule that performs best in a test tube um, or in a primordial soup or in a tight pool would actually grow more and more, make more of itself, outcompete others, and eventually um, win out and become the molecule that created life as we know it, gradually going to more and more complexity. Right? Now, this idea got a lot of boost by two scientists, Sidney Altman and Tom Cech, that shared the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1989. And so note that this is the chemistry Nobel Prize, right? They are biochemists, they're chemists by training, um, and ultimately allowed that allowed them to understand the catalytic functions of RNA molecules that they discovered. In particular, Tom Cech found a so-called group one intron that has the ability to cut uh, itself out from in between two uh, blue RNA sequences here, this intron in yellow would do two chemical transesterification reactions as we call them. Um, an OH group, an alcohol group from the RNA can cut itself, uh, cut the RNA molecule upstream here. And then the blue molecule here links together with the other one. And this process is done uh, a thousand times in our cells right now by a much more complex machine than these group one introns. But the thought is that maybe these group one and some other um, enzymes that do that on their own without any help of proteins could have been the ancestors to what we now call the spices on the big machine that does this with the help of RNA and protein. Sidney Ordman, on the other hand, discovered the catalytic properties of this RNA sp enzyme, again, a very ancient enzyme that um, uh, uses tRNAs and actually clips off the ends to make them mature and making the molecule that I showed earlier. And this RNAs P also doesn't need any proteins to do that. It can do that in high salt concentrations and be the catalyst showing between Sidney Ortman and Tom Cech that RNA is structurally so complex that it actually can form catalysts that have similar complexities as protein enzymes and can catalyze very similar reactions, mostly on RNA backbones. And again, the ribosome is an example, as I mentioned earlier, it also makes the peptide bond. So it can be synthetic as well, not just cutting. And um, that is actually mediated by the RNA component, the so-called ribosomal RNA in the ribosome. Now, uh, just to give a little bit of context, all these discoveries over the last few decades uh, led us, uh, as Julia mentioned, to found the Center for RNA Biomedicine. My colleague, Max Longman from medical school and I did that. Um, to promote and develop cross disciplinary collaborations on RNA across campus, mentor the next generation of RNA biomedical scientists, and um, enrich the intellectual and training environment, which in some way this seminar today um, contributes to. Now, um, I also would be remiss if I wouldn't mention that just a few months ago, end of 19, uh, 2020, um, two Nobel Prizes actually were given for RNA related discoveries. For one, these three gentlemen, uh, for the discovery of hepatitis C virus, um, shared a Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine. And hepatitis C virus or HCV is of course a major concern, global health, uh, it harms the liver and it has an RNA genome. And so um, this is, uh, and, they, and now we have uh, compounds that inhibit the replication of the virus. So medicines have been developed based on this discovery of RNA, the RNA genome and what it can do. And also within a few days of the, the other one, the Nobel Prize for, again, chemistry was given to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudner for the development of a method of genome editing. You might have heard about CRISPR craze or CRISPR, uh, which is uh, aptly named a uh, very crisp idea with which you can cut the human or other any other genome and insert new sequences, which could be the future cure-all of genetic diseases. Again, of course, have to be ethically uh, implemented. Uh, and Jennifer particularly is a pioneer on that front as well, but it has a lot of promise and has already been uh, over the last eight, nine years since this discovery, 
really led to a revolution of the biosciences and what we can do in the lab. Now, also, I would be remiss if I wouldn't mention SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that we are all suffering from. And right now, that's why we're meeting uh, by webinar instead of in person. And so SARS-CoV-2 is, of course, an RNA virus. About 30,000 nucleotides of RNA genome are packaged into the viral uh, capsid here, into the little particle, and um, packaged with the spike proteins that uh, also now um, vaccines have been developed for. And um, we, as the Center for RNA Biomedicine, actually dedicated a whole magazine to 2020 as the year of the RNA virus, as you see here. And if anything, SARS-CoV-2, and particularly the variants that are in everyone's mouth now, B117, uh, um, are actually showing that evolution is at work. The sequence of the virus is evolving very, very rapidly if it replicates extensively in a person's body. That body produces antibodies that then shape the genome of that virus to escape these antibodies. And that gives rise to these variants that now are more infectious and evade, at least to some extent, the human immune response because they have evolved to do that. So this is just a reminder that a small RNA molecule that has some replicative capabilities, although it's not really life as we know it, because it lacks much of the other machinery, but it can evolve very, very rapidly within months, within even days, within a patient um, that is infected. And, uh, and that's just, to me, at least more evidence that an RNA world and evolution out of an RNA world of the complexity that we know now today could have done, happened over the last two billion years easily. Now, again, I mentioned already the mRNA vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna that have come to the fore. Um, clearly, um, and I should mention it's a company in Germany, BioNTech involved here as well with Pfizer. Um, and Kalamazoo, of course, has one of the production sites of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, they are safe mRNA-based vaccines. Why were they able to develop them in as fast as 45 days? Well, because we already knew so much about RNA, because of the um, basic science investments that had been done, uh, made in the past, that led to quick insights into how to build um, a spike protein-related mRNA vaccine that now can immunize people um, before they get infected, right? And so RNA is coming to the rescue. And so this is just an example, maybe a very uh, prominent example of how RNA research and even RNA molecules themselves can really advance medicine as we know it. Now, let me talk about a couple of projects for my lab. I want to do that as well, of course. And um, we are peeking inside the cell. We can do that uh, using physical chemistry tools that allow us single molecule fluorescence microscopy observation. And they're typically built around a microscope that has an objective and then uses a laser beam that can come in through the objective here in green and is bouncing off the surface by what we call total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy or TERF. And that TERF microscopy um, creates what is called an evanescent field, a very thin layer of light, about 100 nanometers thin only at the surface. This has to do with the duality of light being both a particle that bounces off as well as a wave that penetrates just a little bit, uh, a fraction of the wavelength through that interface with solution above the, uh, the cover slip here. Um, and that allows us to illuminate molecules that are bound to the surface with very little illumination of molecules that float about. And that gives us the ability to see single molecules against a very low background because little else will even be exposed to light other than this very thin sheet. And you see that here in an example where you see um, two colors, green and red. There are two fluorophores uh, attached to it. These fluorophores get, or one of the fluorophores gets excited by the green light here and emits in green. But then the other one would be uh, emitting in red because it can get energy transferred from the first one. And that, in this particular case, gives us information about the shape of individual molecules and how they change over time as they switch from green to red and back to green. And you can see the background is pretty small, and we know that each of these spots is a single molecule. You can also do this 
in a different configuration, which is called a prism-based turf microscope in, uh, in contrast to an objective-based turf. Here, the, only, the main difference is that the laser beam is coming in from a top through a prism and coupled into a quartz slide. But again, the observation is through uh, an inverted mi microscope objective that you see here of the fluorescence of molecules that are attached to the surface. So we use both of these types of configurations. We have a couple of different microscopes for that purpose. Now, aside from actually able, being able to see single molecules, we can also pinpoint their position very accurately. And this is sometimes referred to as single molecule for instance, nanoscopy, breaking into nanoscale, uh, at least tens of nanometers. And that is illustrated here. So the same camera images that I showed you before with low background and the fluorescence spots here can now be analyzed in a way where we actually look at that signal spread over several pixels of the camera here. And you see that um, colored signal here, it um, has um, a shape similar to a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. Then we use mathematical, mathematical, mathematical function that uh, is shown here in the mesh to fit to this um, point spread function the, of the light distribution. And with low residuals, we get a good fit that gives us two main parameters. One is the width of half maximum, which tells us something about uh, the resolution of our microscope, and that's typically 200 nanometers. But then the center position is also resolved to something like 10 to 20 nanometer resolution, given, depending on the goodness of fit. And so that allows us to break the diffraction limit, which was thought to be 200 nanometers, by at least 10 to 20 fold, because we can pinpoint the position of a fluorophore as being in the middle of this point spread function here, pinpointed by that Gaussian fitting. And that gives us information of whether the green and red spot uh, in the two channels are on the same molecule in the same spot or not uh, separate from one another. Now, this single molecule microscopy really has um, broadened the ability of microscopy uh, to go into smaller and smaller um, distances or, or scales. So wide field and turf microscopy, as I showed before, goes to sub micrometer resolution. But with these various different what we call super resolution microscopy tools based on this point spread function fitting that I showed, we are getting into the realm of 100 nanometer 10 nanometer, some people claim even one nanometer um, resolution with these techniques. And that's of course where chemistry is happening. So really these physical tools, physical chemistry, physics tools allow us to go where chemistry inhabits life as we know it, right? In the process, in the size of proteins and small molecules. Now you can also ask, well, why bother buying these expensive microscopes and going into the depth of this analysis here? And my analogy, of course, being at Michigan has to do with the Michigan Stadium. Of course, this is not how it looks right now, but it looked a few years like this uh, when uh, these um, VIP booths were still being built, as you see in the background here. What you see here is actually a stadium fully filled with 114,000 people, many of them Michigan fans clad in yellow and blue. Uh, and then there are Ohio State fans, which are clad in red, but are not allowed close to the field except for the, to the team playing. So you can see a lot of people here in the upper ranks only. But you cannot make out much unless you actually see individual people and their behavior and you see them excited or less so, or ideally you have actually a movie of them behaving because each person behaves a little differently. So this person gets particularly excited, right? This person next to them cannot quite understand why that's the case. Here, this person is a little bit more subdued than the other people around them. And the same is true if you think of the stadium as a cell in your body with all these RNA molecules in them. They are zooming around. They're actually moving around. We'll look at that in a moment. And they're going places, but each one has its own fate. Each one has its own behavior. And without seeing these single molecules behavior behave, we cannot understand how a cell functions because it's the aggregate of individual heterogeneous behaviors, individual fates of molecules in the cell that dictates how the cell as a whole behaves. Okay, so this is the argument for using single molecule tools. Now, the first example then where we'll apply them is in these microRNAs, short miRNAs that I mentioned before. Again, they are made by transcription in the nucleus of the cell. They are processed there uh, made a little bit smaller into so-called precursor microRNAs that are exported to the nuclear pore complex that I've mentioned. Then they assemble with another enzyme called DICER that literally dices it into even smaller so-called mature microRNAs that now assemble with a cis 
risk complex, RNA induced cytokine syn complex that I mentioned, that has an enzyme that removes one of the two complementary strands that still remain. The green strand here is the passenger strand, it's cleaved and discarded. Remaining is the blue strand, the so called guide strand, that now instructs this risk machinery to find a complementary messenger RNA and inhibit the ribosome and keeping it from translating. And there are, there was, when we started this work, a bit of controversy, whether it's really inhibition of translation or it's mRNA degradation. So the RNA being handed off by the risk, mo pro uh, risk machinery to a so-called processing body, which is a bag, a liquid that phase separated aggregation of ribonucleases in the cell that um, once the mRNA is delivered there, might just degrade it and cut it up like little Pac-Man here. And so the controversy was which of these two is it? Ribosome inhibition, translation inhibition, or the degradation of the mRNA. So we developed a tool, and this was done by chemistry graduate student Sidi Pichaya, who was actually uh, going to start the faculty position at Michigan in urology this fall. And Amiya Jaliha, who was a CMV cellular molecular biology student who just moved on to postdoc at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and they and others um, that I'm not showing here, but um, uh, CETA was the first one really to develop this tool, which we call tongue-in-cheek I Sherlock intracellular single molecule high resolution localization and counting, which makes us Sherlock Holmes of what these RNAs are doing inside the cell. We do that by fluorophore labeling them, right, with the dye molecule that we observe, can observe in our turf microscope here. And then we inject them into cultured cells, cells from the human body, HeLa cells, Helen Luxa cells, specifically uh, we've used. And um, they are cultured here on the little dish. And then after injecting the RNA, in this case a microRNA with a fluorophore and the three prime end um, into the cell, they diffuse about and eventually assemble with micro risk complex, with messenger RNAs, and with this processing bodies, key bodies that I mentioned. And we can follow them by using a, what is called near turf or high low microscopy, which is slightly different in that it um, goes through the entire body of the cell, but still provides low background so that it can follow single molecules because it goes at an angle like this, that is almost like a turf angle, and allows us to basically have very little background. And that allows us using this nanoscopy track to follow the diffusion of a molecule at 10 to 20 nanometer resolution through the cell by single particle tracking, or we can instead fix the cell, everything is dead now, but also put in place. And that allows us to then uh, stay with the same molecule, the molecule doesn't move, and see how many fluorophores are on there. If single microRNAs carry a single fluorophore, we might see three photobleaching steps where the signal disappears as each of the fluorophores independently is bleached or uh, loses its fluorescence and uh, upon exposure to light. And that signal tells us that there are three microRNA molecules because there are three single steps here together in a single spot. And that tells us something about stoichiometry. Okay. So with that, we can now um, do the experiment. You see a little bit of depiction here. We can take our cultured cells, you see them here uh, as a differential contrast image uh, with nuclei here and then a larger cell body is, would be this. And then our little needle, the microinjector needle hovers over the cells and injects into little ones. And every so often you little, see a little puff coming out and the cell reacting a little bit. And those microRNAs now go about their business inside the cell because they're directly injected into the cytoplasm or we can do that with the nucleus as well. And now we can use um, different tools, this is, um, either epi illumination or this high low or near turf illumination in order to see the behavior of individual molecules. Um, and um, ultimately, see where that this place. Um, if you have two cells here, two cells that are both uh, HeLa cells in this particular case, then we can see. Um, them filled with fluorescent spots. And uh, again, we need the high-low microscopy and not uh, epi-illumination, not going straight to the cell, but this high-low in order to get enough, uh, low enough background. And then you can see individual molecules diffused through the cell. And again, I might have to convince my computer to play this again. So here you see one cell on the left, 
in a cell on the right, you see individual diffusing particles, which are these microRNAs with single fluorophores on them. And you can see that they are either diffusing randomly, brown in diffusion, or they diffuse along a track, in which case we know that they're being transported. This is also called super diffusion or directed diffusion. And we can characterize this using some plots of different kinds and extracting diffusion constants. And from that, we learned quite a bit. So our microRNA after injection is first naked, then a large fraction of them we've shown assemble with micro risk complex that then binds a complementary messenger RNA as instructed by the guide RNA here with a throw four on it and um, you know, throw four in red. And that's what we can observe. Once they are assembled into these large megadalton complexes, they're slow enough for us to diffuse, uh, to observe as diffusing particles that you see here. Um, when they actually then locate with processing bodies, they become even more slow diffusing because these processing bodies are um, uh, liquid liquid phase separate particles, so they're large aggregates that are pretty immobile in the cell. And as a consequence, we can see essentially diffusion behaviors that are plotted here um, as a half logarithmic plot, where you see basically a diffusion constant on the order of um, one or um, zero on the logarithmic scale here, um, characterizing these um, messenger RNA bound microRNAs. And you can see them two hours, four hours, or eight hours after microinjection. You can also see that this population here uh, between one and 10 uh, or between one and 0 0.1 micrometers squared per second diffusion constant are these faster diffusing property um, molecules, microRNA. And then you have the slower diffusing ones that are already bound to the processing bodies, um, another order of magnitude slower in diffusion. And we can see that if you look carefully that over time, the um, uh, slow diffusing particles become a little faster and accelerate in diffusion constant, moving into this gray zone where they are too fast for us to still observe. They just blur out. And that gave rise to the notion that there are actually two processes going on. First, microRNA translationally represses or inhibits the messenger RNA from making protein. Uh, that happens within a time constant of about one hour. Again, physical chemistry thought of Kinetics is important here. And then we are able to show that over a much uh, longer time scale, seven hour time constant, now um, after assembling with these pre bodies, eventually the microRNAs are set free again and to start diffusing faster, as you saw in the shift to the right here. And that has to do with the messenger RNA presumably being degraded at this time scale of several hours and then the microRNA going back to the cell to do it over again. And so this gives rise to the idea that there are actually two kinetically separate processes, a fast and a slower process that separate translation inhibition and mRNA degradation. They are sequential steps rather than simultaneous steps. So both sides were right. And ultimately the argument here is that uh, in the previous con controversy that I mentioned, that it's not either or, but it's one after the other of these two processes that occur. And for the first time, by looking at the process inside the cell, as all the different behaviors manifest, we actually see the elephant for, it, for what it is, and not just a snake, a spear, a fan, a rope, a wall, a tree for that people, um, that men that are blindfolded might have thought, okay? That only see part of the process. Now we also can do now two color imaging, so kind of spectroscopy, if you wish, where we can follow single RNA molecules and processing bodies at the same time. And the RNA uh, in red, um, the microRNA can diffuse to the processing body in green and uh, associate with it, bind to it. And this is just characterizing the diverse behaviors that we see here and really seeing is believing here in that we can see uh, a microRNA stuck in the processing body or moving around processing body or being captured by the processing body into stable binding complexes. Other microRNAs have a different fate where they um, dissociate over the surface but never quite dark or they escape from the interior so they are only transiently binding. And so these are different examples that you see in um, temp time images. And so um, in essence, what we are able to show in our publication cited here is that these processing bodies, these um, 
elemental liquid liquid phase separated particles are actually uh, have a shell and a core the core is more gel like things get stuck in here eventually a messenger rna getting stuck in here would be degraded messenger rna is still translation active might or micro rna associated with it might just diffuse over the surface and um try it out but never quite associate stably with it um and uh, that gives rise to a core shell model where the shell is much more dynamic and it's more soul-like and the core is much more gel-like and much less dynamic. Right? Okay, so physical chemistry, polymer physics in this case, insights can help us um, understand the behavior of the cell. Uh, also, well, we're getting close to the end, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit just to say that we can also use physical chemistry tools, single micro observation, to find the proverbial needle in a haystack. I have some competing financial interests to declare here, which I'm doing here. And, um, but here the question is, okay, the cell is complex, lots of different molecules in there. How can you find a single molecule? And this is um, related to the idea that uh, in the body, there are RNA molecules that are made in a cell, but they also are secreted by cells into the bloodstream. They're so-called extracellular RNAs in a bloodstream uh, that then can be taken up by a recipient cell elsewhere in the body and instruct the cell to do something different. That is what, for example, is thought to have a tumor coordinate between the different cells. They actually exchange RNA material that instructs them to do different things by gene regulation. And um, these RNA molecules are formed in the bloodstream and can actually serve as a biomarker of disease, of a tumor growing in a patient's body. Right? And But how do you find this needle in a haystack? And this is illustrated here. So when we um, first just did um, uh, a work with, with um, imaging single molecules, but only having a still image, we would not see more than many, many different spots here that we light up uh, with a, a fluorescent detection probe. But then um, when we use a movie and choose a fluorescent detection probe that binds, but also rapidly dissociates to a target molecule, as you see here, that's captured on the surface, then we get a target specific signal of blinking of rapid on and off signal of any little spots on the surface that then allow us to tell that oh this is not the right molecule it doesn't blink the right way or it doesn't blink at all this is the right molecule that has the right kinetic fingerprint because it has this probe binding dissociation dissociating with just the right kinetics to tell us okay this is the right molecule we are interested in that is a biomarker of disease. And that allowed, that really removed the hurdle from single molecule observation, which is that you in a still image would not know which molecules to count, but here you can um, basically count just the right molecules, okay? And so this we have now developed into um, a tool that um, allows us to um, measure the concentration of microRNAs in the bloodstream, for example, with this principle that I just showed. Here's an artistic rendition of that. We get a particular kinetic fingerprint of signal only with the right type of molecule, maize and blue here come together, right? And uh, again, this is the right molecule. Without a target, we would see very different kinetic behavior. And because this is a Poissonian complex um, of binding dissociation that is um, random in, in, in many ways. We called it single molecule recognition through equilibrium Poisson sampling or SIMRAPS. Um, and we're able to show that as a Poissonian process, the number of binding dissociation or on and off signals blinks here increases over time. If we just wait long enough, we get 100% certainty that we are looking at the right molecule and only counting that and measuring its concentration directly by counting, okay? And so we can show also that we can uh, find one in a million mutants versus wild type, which is important because in the bloodstream, of course, lots of wild type uh, nucleic acids or DNA molecules in this case would be diffusing. We also can avoid the heated, the heating that a PCR reaction requires, which actually spontaneously deaminates the cytosine into universal that now looks like the mutant uh, and is dis difficult to distinguish by PCR. We can remove any such deaminated product from our solution and can really distinguish one mutant in a million or more white type molecules as shown here in the data. And we can do that in minimally treated biofluids like blood, saliva, and other places. If you ask, we haven't applied this to SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's just too sensitive of a signal um, that's not really needed for the virus, but we can detect one femtomolar or lower 
concentrations of nucleic acids, and we recently showed that the same principle can be used even for proteins um, and other target molecules. So the take home messages are, RNA is all around us and in us and has been for a long time. As chemists, let's embrace it, right? And this is what I try to do today. MicroRNAs and other RNAs can be tracked inside cells to study the intracellular mechanisms. So chemistry can come to the rescue here and reveal um, biology, specifically physical chemistry. And then single biomarker molecules can be sensitively and specifically detected and counted and the concentration measured, um, which has applications in analytical chemistry, of course, and molecular diagnostics, which is what the company is trying to commercialize now. And with that, I wanted to, um, of course, uh, thank my team. This is from before um, social distancing times, uh, 2019, when we found, uh, celebrate our 20 year anniversary. Um, lots of people contributed. I showed some on slides. Um, not enough time to name everyone, but it's really a team that works together. We also have great collaborators, Aro Shanae and Santiago Schnell and um, Manish Tivari on various projects I talked about and funding agencies. Of course, I want to thank you also for your attention. Thanks.